This is the first ever iPod from 2001. This is the device that pulled Apple up from the grave and into the mainstream once again, and would eventually lead to the iPhone. This is a really cool device, and I recently bought it off eBay. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and this video is a bit different because not only am I showing my face for some reason, but instead of just talking about how this iPod holds up today, we're gonna go over if you can even use it anymore in the first place. And uh, that wasn't the original plan when I bought this iPod. I suppose it shouldn't be a surprise that an 18 year old piece of tech would require some extra steps to get it up and running, but I didn't really think that far ahead. So let's talk about the whole process of getting music on this thing and actually having it work. After you go follow me on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore tech, because what do you have to lose? Anyways, let's rewind back to a couple weeks ago. I won this iPod in a bidding war for $85 US, which was actually a pretty decent price for it. And uh, well, after that, I sat back happily and relaxed for a while until I realized that I didn't actually have a charger that would work for it because it uses Firewire, a cord that basically doesn't exist anymore, and also one that I had never even used in my lifetime, much less owned. So whatever, I bought one off eBay for 10 bucks. No harm, no foul. Except this was a Firewire to Firewire cable, and I couldn't find any adapter to USB. This was strange, but upon a little bit of googling, I found out that you can't convert Firewire to USB at all. Oh well, I looked at eBay a little bit more and found a wall adapter that was Firewire, and it was only 10 bucks, so I bought that. This brought the running total up to about $120 after taxes, as well as shipping, which is a pretty good price for a fully working iPod. And once all the packages arrived, I zipped down to the United States to pick them up. It's worth mentioning that I live in Canada, hence the Canucks sweater, so ordering off of eBay can be a bit of a pain because most stuff is in the States, which means very large shipping charges. So what I do is I uh, ship stuff to a location just across the border, and then I drive down there, get the stuff, and come back up. Bit of a hassle but it's worth it to save some money. Anyways, I uh, eagerly pulled the iPod out of its package, and it was dead. No worries, I bought a charger for a reason. I got it out, plugged it in, and voila, the iPod was alive. It was cool. I messed around with the scroll wheel a bit. Did you know this scroll wheel actually spins? Like, you can, you can hear it spin? Some of you probably think I'm an idiot for not knowing that, but in my defense I had only used the newer iPod classics, which are all touch wheels, so I had no idea this was a thing. Anyways, the iPod was neat and all, and I enjoyed messing around with it, until, well, it died about five minutes after use. This told me I needed to replace the battery, and this time I went to Amazon. It took a bit of searching to find a battery that I knew guaranteed would fit the device. I mean, these iPods aren't exactly super common anymore, but I did with relative ease, and so I added it to the cart for the very fair price of $20. It said the battery was high capacity, and it is, at least relative to the original. The original battery in the iPod has 1200 milliamp hours, while this one had 2200 milliamp hours, so with it I should get about double the battery life, which is pretty nice. Alright, so life was good. I hadn't quite put the order in because I figured I might add more to the package, so I left it for the time being. I wanted to mess with the iPod a little further. Sure, it died after 5 minutes, but at least it worked, right? So I went to put some music on it. I pulled out my old 2012 MacBook Pro because I'm so darn smart and knew that these things have Firewire ports on them. So therefore, I should be able to plug in the iPod directly to it, right? So I set this thing up, got the charger, tried to plug it in, and uh, no port would fit it. I could have sworn these things had a Firewire port, even if I hadn't used it before. Had I been lied to? No, I was just an idiot. Turns out there's two versions of Firewire cables. There's Firewire 400 and 800. The iPod used 400, and that's what I had, while the MacBook used 800, which is, uh, right here, which you can kind of see. So back to Amazon, I went to buy the 400 to 800 cable so I could just plug it directly into my MacBook. 
I put in the order, and I waited. About a week later, the package finally comes in, and it's time to replace the battery. I had already looked up how to do it online, and it actually seemed pretty easy, so I turned on my camera, and I started attempting to open up the device. The trick is to get something small and flat in between the groove of plastic and metal, and pull it up in one of the kind of holes that serve to click it in. This YouTube video I watched made it look super duper easy, so I went to work. Oddly enough, the device was being a bit stubborn. Unperturbed, I channeled my inner Hugh Jeffries and continued trying to pull it open, and kept trying and some more, and tried some more. Well, the plastic plier thing wasn't working, so I switched to the flat screwdriver it came with and attempted to use that. It's actually worth mentioning, the battery came with quite a few useful tools, which was nice, even though you don't actually need any of the other screwdrivers it came with. If you want one of these batteries for whatever reason, I'll link it in the description down below, as well as all the resources I used to try to get the darn iPod to open. And going back to that, I was not making any progress. This was ridiculous and all I was doing was adding unnecessary scratches. I searched some more stuff up online. Unsurprisingly, resources on dissembling the first ever iPod were a little bit scarce, but one thing most of these tutorials did have in common was that getting the iPod open was the most difficult part of the process. This was super helpful, because who needs tips to get it open when you could just reaffirm my pain? Eventually I came to this YouTube video, which again I'll link below, and this one was significantly more helpful in the sense that at least I knew I wasn't a complete idiot. Like half the video is a time lapse of this guy trying to open the iPod in every way possible, which I found hilarious considering I was struggling with the same thing. Every tutorial was exactly the same. Start in the corner with the Firewire port. I finally gave up trying this because it wasn't working. I went to the bottom left corner, and wouldn't you know it, the thing like immediately popped open. I didn't get the original time on film, but here's me doing it again after upgrading the battery, so you can kind of see what it looked like. I can't guarantee this will work for everyone, but for me, this was the sweet spot to get it to pop open really easily. After this, it was pretty easy. I just gently pried up all around the iPod and then pulled the front off of the metal backing. I then removed the old battery by first pulling it off the adhesive strips. You might notice this battery is definitely not stock. It would appear someone has put an aftermarket battery in it already, which is interesting. If I had to guess, it was probably a really long time ago, considering the battery is basically done. Again, it would only last like five minutes fully charged, so I have no idea when they could have replaced this battery, but I would be surprised if it was within the last 10 years. I pulled the battery off and then unplugged it from the motherboard. This probably wasn't the best way to do it, but I gently wiggled the base of the wires while pulling, and it came right out. All right, that was done, so now I put in the bigger and better battery. First step was to plug it in, which was easy, and as soon as I did, the device actually turned on. This was certainly a good sign, so I went to stick the battery on, and it wouldn't stick. The adhesive had lost its grip, so I pulled out some double-sided tape I had, pulled off the old adhesive, put on the new tape, and then stuck on the battery. I then pushed the wires out of the way of the metal backing and put it back on. I clicked everything in, and boom, I had a fully working iPod. The new battery works perfectly, and overall, this was a pretty simple swap. The main thing is just trying to get the darn thing open. The tutorials were right, that is the hardest part, but once you get past that, it's super simple. But hey, the iPod works, so now I just needed to load it with some music. I grabbed my 2012 MacBook Pro, dusted it off briefly, and turned it on for the first time in quite a while. Apologies for the filthy screen and all. I didn't realize how bad it was until after the fact, and I was too lazy to go back and clean it all and then refilm everything, so sorry about that. I plugged in the Firewire cord to the MacBook and then into the iPod. It connected pretty quickly, and as soon as it did, iTunes actually recognized it as a new iPod, which was kind of cool. Once I went past the opening page, the iPod was there in its full 5 gigabyte glory. Interestingly, iTunes does actually still have a photo for it. I wasn't sure if they'd have a picture of the first gen iPod or if they would just use a newer iPod classic, but there it is. So I went to download some music to the device and had an unfortunate realization. I don't actually own any songs on iTunes. I'd always used Spotify in the past and had never bothered buying anything, so 
Oops. After brief consideration if I should just import some mp3 files or what, I decided to actually buy an album, specifically the album Odyssey by Home. They make a lot of songs I've used in a lot of my videos, I really like their stuff, so I bought that album and downloaded it to my computer. Then I went ahead and synced them to the iPod. After about a minute they were synced, so I ejected the iPod and was good to go. I maneuvered to the iPod's music and sure enough, the album was there. I'm not gonna lie, I find it pretty cool how easy it is to download music to an 18 year old device. The biggest speed bump was really just connecting this thing to the computer and all you need for that is the right cable and an older Mac that uh, has Firewire. And once I did that, even on the newest version of iTunes, I was able to sync my music with absolutely no issue. I think Apple deserves credit for the fact that it's super easy to download music to an 18 year old device. That's crazy. This thing is technically completely usable, and with the new battery, it's running as good as new. I finally plugged in my headphones and went to listen to the music. Not super surprisingly, there is some lag to load up songs, likely due to the very old hard drive you can hear whirring like crazy when it's trying to do something. Theoretically, you could upgrade the storage of this iPod with flash storage, and that would drastically increase speeds, but upon some research it seems that it would either be extremely difficult or impossible due to the FireWire interface. Regardless, I'd rather keep it with the original hard drive anyway, just so it's a little bit more authentic. This iPod is really darn cool, and music sounds good, I guess. I'm not particularly an audio expert, so to me it just sounds like music. It was clear, no static, and I mean, that's all I really need from a music player. I think your headphones are gonna make more of a difference than this iPod will when it comes to the audio quality. And that brings us to now, where I have a fully functional first generation iPod, and if anything, it's it's better than ever with the upgraded battery. It plays music, and that's mostly it, although there is a basic Brick Breaker game, which is cool. Also something cool, although it's kind of hard to see on camera, there is a backlight so you can see it in the dark, although you shouldn't keep it on for too long because it will kill your battery. This iPod is full of quirks and features, but this video wasn't really about that. I just want to talk about my experience getting it up and running, and how it's totally doable, despite the fact that, again, it's 18 years later. Not that I'd recommend going out and buying the first ever iPod just to use for music because that would be expensive and fairly pointless. If you really want to do that, one of the newer iPod classics is probably a good idea. They're not super duper cheap, but they have a lot more hard drive capacity and they're just going to be a lot better. Again, all the resources I used uh, to make this video will be in the description down below, so if you're interested in it, go check it out. And if you want to see more videos on this iPod, hit that like button. I'd really like to do more for pretty obvious reasons. This is a really cool device. And with that being said, I think I'm pretty much done here. Did you ever have an old iPod classic, or was that before your time? Let me know in the comments down below. If you're new around here and enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and you can always follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at 91 underscore or tech for more cool tech stuff. Thank you so much for watching. This was a very fun video to make, and maybe I'll do some more like it in the future. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.